Well, I hope you, um, I hope you enjoyed your lunch. I'm, if those of you who don't know me, I'm Steve Walkley. I'm the director of the Rose F. Kennedy IDDRC. Uh, welcome back uh, to an afternoon of talks. I'm sure it'll be just as interesting and, and as engaging as this morning. I really want to thank uh, Sophie Malholm for putting together this really outstanding uh, program. And, um, you know, I'm, I don't know about the rest of you, and I really appreciate seeing the images of Isabel in a number of the talks this morning, but I can, you know, sitting here, I could literally feel her in the room, and I remember so well, uh, Sylvia, I think she was sitting about where you're sitting right now at the last time she was here, and she had no hesitation whatsoever bellowing out questions of the speakers at the, uh, it, when she finished, uh, when they, they finished speaking. And um, so I really, I feel like she's right here in the room with us. And it's, uh, for all of us who knew her, it's a, it's a, a warm and wonderful feeling to think about her and uh, all that she had, has done for us uh, and for the world of autism and communication disorders. That said, uh, it's now my privilege to introduce a friend and colleague of mine, uh, John Fox. Uh, many of you know John. Uh, John actually got his PhD here at Einstein a number of years ago and then left and became an internationally famous neuroscientist, and then came back, was recruited back. And in fact, uh, John and I renewed the funding of the Rose F. Kennedy IDDRC now nearly a decade ago. And John was instrumental uh, in helping develop the idea of having this, uh, this conference annually to celebrate Isabel Rappin's uh, contribution. So John, it's a real pleasure uh, to have you here. John, of course, got recruited off to Rochester, where he's director of a neuroscience institute, of the chair of neuroscience, holds a, 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 a chair, in, a, a name chair in neuroscience, uh, and is also director of the imaging center there. So, I, you know, a very busy guy. John, it's so great to have you back uh, with us. And uh, John will talk about developing neuromarkers for autism. Fantastic. Thanks, Steve. Steve said before, with all those titles, I hope they're paying you a lot of money. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's, it's fantastic to be at Einstein, which is home for me. Um, I was educated here. And I live across the road in City Island still. Um, and so uh, Isabel uh, was a major towering figure at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and also in my own life too. So just a couple of quick reflections. That's Steve and I, obviously, with Isabel. Uh, I think that's the second annual meeting, or, or annual uh, meeting. And this was the first one. Um, and so there's Sophie, that's John Constantino, who, who Isabel absolutely loved, who's the director of the IDRC out at Wash U, and Philip and myself and Isabel. Uh, and she loved a glass of wine and to just berate us about things, as is a common theme. Um, this is a picture just for, for those of you who've been around here longer than you want to admit. Hilary Gums and Sylvia will remember these. And, and I put it up here because, well, that's me. In uh, 1988, I came here. I don't usually admit that, so that's 30 years ago. And, uh, and that's Dave Stapels. And I worked for Dave um, doing auditory brainstem responses on the eighth floor of the Kennedy Center. So that's how I got how I. Uh, got my spurs or whatever one says uh, as a technician for for quite some number of years and uh, and that's Herb Vaughan and, and Judy Kreutzer and, and fo folks who recognize Rich Bernstein there um, and Isabel's office was four doors down Michelle if she's still here will remember and I did the brainstem responses for Isabel's minimally verbal or nonverbal kids so, of course, one of the things you want to do is you've got a child who's nonverbal. Is it a hearing problem? You need to rule that out, and they can't tell you whether they hear or they don't hear. So they were sent down to me for the brainstem responses. Um, between us and Isabel was Judy Gravel's audiology suite, and there was an audiologist there, Daphne, who used to work. And I would do the brainstems, and of course, you could never do the tests or write the reports fast enough for Isabel. And what would happen is Daphne would call me as she'd see Isabel coming down the hallway and say, she's on her way, she's on the warpath. <laughs> and then we would, well, David would run and hide, because we were all a little bit terrified of Isabel. 
Um, and and quite, quite some interesting things occurred. For, for example, one of the things that we, we noted very quickly, in those days you gave the children chloral hydrate. Brainstem responses are tricky little devils to record. So you, gave the ki you give the kids chloral hydrate. I don't think you would do that today. Um, essentially a hallucinogen. And, uh, and most kids fall asleep happy. But what would happen quite a lot with the kids with, this, kids with severe autism is we would have paradoxical responses and they would literally bounce off the walls. I don't know that uh, 30 years later we've gotten to the bottom of what's going on there, but really speaking to a very different neurochemistry. Um, but we loved her, we feared her, and she was amazing. And it's great, really, really great for me to be here uh, to speak at this uh, sixth one. So I'm, I'm going to very quickly tour through just three experiments that, that we've done in the Cogneuro lab here and, and at Rochester, at Einstein and Rochester, over the last few years. Uh, three atypicalities in the way children with autism process visual inputs. Again, going to stuff that Sylvie noticed for many years, that this very fixation that kids will often have in the spectrum with the, with the peripheral vision that got us thinking about some of these kinds of um, things. So eye movements and the mapping of visual space in early sensory regions, let's kick off there. So here, here's, a, here's something that um, folks like us like to do. If you've got an eye tracker on somebody and you just ask them to fixate, and then you pop something up on the side of the screen. You say, the minute you see the thing on the side of the screen, I want you to look over there as quickly as possible, and then just look back to the center. So we're just going to map saccades. Once the eyes go in, f in flight, once they're moving, we play a devilish trick, which is that we move the target a few degrees in. So we move it a little bit closer. And what happens is, of course, you're kind of a little bit functionally blind when your eyes are moving. That's why the world doesn't just slide. It doesn't make you dizzy all the time. Um, and what will happen is people don't know that the target's been moved a couple of degrees. And over the course of a number of trials, you'll see an adaptation. So if this is 10 degrees of, of saccade, saccade, saccade direction, <clears throat> over the course of loads and loads of trials, the ballistics of the eye movement will shorten. And so it's, it's essentially an error adaptation, a motor, sensory motor integration error adaptation. It's a good thing to have. It's very useful, for example, in figuring out exactly how to track words on a page and so on. And uh, in fact, what will happen is if somebody has a vermal lesion, we know that this is cerebellar dependent, because if you have lesions in the cerebellum, you'll find that people don't do this saccade adaptation. They land wherever they think they're supposed to be going to, and they don't correct for that. And uh, for many years, there was a thesis that the cerebellum might be specifically impacted in autism. And so we did some work on this. And in fact, found that here's a neurotypical kid. You, they're making saccades out to about 12 degrees here. And they do, you know, there's a certain variance term around it. And then you start pulling the, the target into 10 degrees. And over the course of 40 or 50 trials, that's what happens in humans, they adapt to a different thing. You readapt them back out that you don't really want to send them out into the world with saccades that aren't really working the way they should. Uh, and here's a kid on the spectrum. And what you'll notice is, that they, this kid's not adapting, or not adapting much, and that there's actually quite a high degree of variance in the saccades. And we had been seeing this. And of course, there's nobody in this room who's worked with a kid on the spectrum who's not surprised to hear, or who's going to be surprised to hear, or to think about peculiarities in the way that kids on the spectrum use their eyes, direct their eyes, and so on. Um, what we got to thinking, though, by the way, I should just mention, that's Ed Friedman. He's kind of a grumpy bloke, um, and he did this saccade adaptation work. Okay. When you come into this world as an infant, your visual system is highly immature, extraordinarily immature. And of course, the development of the maps in cortex are going to be uh, dependent on the fidelity of those saccades and how quickly you get to titrate and become good at looking at the things that you intend to look at. And so we just thought, well, one of the things that's said often about these eye movements in autism is that the reason they don't look at you and direct at you and, and have all these uh, purposeful eye movements that we think of is because of social deficits and because of this sort of inability to engage and so on. Uh, an alternate account would just say, well, let's park all that stuff for the moment. What if it's just an imprecise saccadic sensory motor system? What if you just, they're just a couple of degrees, they have a couple of degrees of error? And that's how it, how it works. And so that's, in fact, what happens is then when a kid's on the autism spectrum is looking kind of over your shoulder, it's, it's because these maps are not developed in the same way. So again, one of the things that happens by having lawful, accurate saccades is that you end up in a situation where, here's, if this is space, this very tiny little interior, one degree of space here, the size of your thumbnail at arm's length, essentially, is represented by a massive swath of cortex. 
and then it scales out from there. So you can see the next 10 degrees have this much cortex and so on. So by the time you get out to the periphery, and you know this because you don't see color, you don't see any, you, you very little fine vision out there. You think you do, but you don't if you play with it. There's a very, very tiny piece of cortex <coughs> devoted to processing that. And this is normal. This is a ni really nice work from the monkey using cytochrome oxidase that just shows essentially this map uh, as it expands out um, in cortex. And this work was done by Hans-Peter Frey, who's in Zurich now. Um, so we, we wrote off to the guys who did the original work in the monkeys, and we said, can you send us the numbers for this cortical expansion that was done in squirrel monkeys? And then we just sort of inferred from that what that would look like in a human. And so these are the numbers in a, in a, in a monkey, a squirrel monkey, uh, essentially, um, where you have uh, 40 square millimeters of cortex for this tiny little piece in the middle. And you can see it drops off incredibly rapidly. And then we just said, let's build in a two degree error term. What would that do to the map over time if you had this error term? And so what happens is the black, the, the red trace is, is what we inferred from a squirrel monkey, and the black trace is what we infer would happen if you had error. So we'll call that our test ASD group. So what you'd see is actually, well, you'd have a drop off in the middle, but it would be like from 40 to 36 or something, so a negligible percentage drop off. But where you'd really see expansion is out here in this kind of 5 to 10 degree zone, where actually the proportionality, you start to have more representation for the periphery in autism according to this very simplistic account, just inaccuracy in your saccades. And so it makes a pretty nice prediction about what a visual evoked potential would look like. So these are kids on the spectrum who are looking at a fixation cross, and they're just telling us when it turns from green to red, totally trivial, easy to do, it just means that they're fixating the center. We have an eye tracker on them. And then we flash things around the center, and then out at six degrees in the periphery, and we say, what does the visual evoked potential look like in the center? It should look exactly normal or typical. And what does it look like six degrees out? Well, it should look a little bit bigger in, in kids on the spectrum if they're over-representing peripheral space. And that's exactly what we find. So here's the central. Uh, the red is typically developing. The black trace are kids on the autism spectrum or with an autism spectrum disorder. And then if you just go out peripherally, you can see this nice uh, amplification. These are just various different types of visual stimuli. This one here is what Mick just described we, we, with the inverse correlation method uh, here applied to, to visual evoked potentials. So that's one piece. Let me move on to the second little peculiarity. This is, I think this might be my all-time favorite non-human primate study. It's by a guy called Victor Lame. And what's going on here is he's using these figure ground stimuli. So this may not be projecting so well. But you can see this kind of figure here on a on a background. And there's loads of variants of these kinds of stimuli in, in visual science. And what happens is, if you have a, an electrode in the primary visual cortical area, and you record from the ground, you get a nice response. There's you know time going by, big response, and it decays over time. If you put a, an electrode in a neuron that's representing the edge, there's actually an edge there, there's real end points, then you get a different response. If you put the neuron in, in a, or the electrode in a neuron that's re representing this ground, what happens is when there's no contour there, you get this response. When there is a contour there, the neuron, it's a V1 neuron, it sees exactly the same thing. But the context around it causes it to add an extra response. This is the representation of the ground. And actually what he did, which is what's beautiful here, if you look at this, this is time, and these are electrodes that are essentially marching across this field, and you can see there's the initial response is completely oblivious to the fact that there's a figure on the ground background, right? This is this peak here, right there. And then time marching forward. And you can see the neurons in V1 are actually painting this pop-out surface. So this kind of, I, I find that kind of <laughs> wonderful. Maybe not so wonderful for you guys. <laughs> anyway, we can do this in humans. So this is exactly the same experiment in humans. But this time we have the electrodes on the scalp surface. They complain if we try to put them inside. And so here's time going by. And what happens here is the, black tra the blue trace is when there's no figure on the ground. There's no illusory contour here in this case. And the black trace is when there's an illusory contour present. And so what you notice is just like in the, in, with an electrode in, in, in V1 in a monkey, there's very little uh, difference in the response through about 100 milliseconds. And then you get this modulation. This is just uh, an 
a difference wave here showing that modulation. Every single human being you do this on, it's so robust, you get this, it's so, such a robust measure. You get it in every single one of them. Um, and we know where it comes from, I won't get into that. This was work that was actually done by a grad student here, Micah Murray, many years ago um, in the lab. We've done this in kids. These are neurotypical kids. And what you find is, here's, here's a bunch of six, seven, eight, nine-year-olds, and they're just different types of figure ground segregations, different sizes and so on. But you can see this response is there. It's there in those kids, it's there in 11-year-olds, it's there in 15, 16-year-olds, and of course it's there in adults. So you see, and, and actually there's a developmental trajectory to it, but it's there in kids. It's, it comes in very early. And this work was done by Ted Altshuler in the lab with Sophie and myself. And so we asked, um, will we find this in kids on the spectrum? And so on the top panel here are kids on the spectrum, with a spectrum disorder, and you see that there is an illusory contour effect. And here are the typically developing control kids. And this is just a map of that effect, where again, it comes out of the lateral occipital complex. It's a feedback response in visual cortex. But when we closely examine the timing of the onset of that effect, what we find is that in the kids on the spectrum, it's delayed relative to the kids, the typically developing kids in the left hemisphere, and marginally so in the right hemisphere, but specifically in the left hemisphere. So if you look at typically developing kids, it comes on first in the left hemisphere and, and bilateralizes to the right hemisphere, and in the kids on the spectrum, it just happens a little bit later. So actually, you can see that here. Here are the kids on the spectrum. Here's this effect emerging over the left hemisphere at 120, 130, you see how it is? And then it bilateralizes. But it's considerably later, it's 30 or 40 milliseconds later in autism spectrum disorder. What does 30 or 40 milliseconds later mean? Well, actually it means a lot here because it's, it's essentially within about 40 milliseconds of the information arriving in visual cortex. Remember in the, in the monkeys you saw this period where there was this perfect response that was oblivious to the emergence of the contours. Well, that happens very quickly when the, once you get past that peak, the contours emerge very quickly due to feedback inputs. And what we're finding is that they're emerging a good deal slower relatively in kids on the spectrum. Uh, so essentially, we, we're seeing this delay in feedback processing. And it goes to these kinds of notions of priors and prediction and that. So the idea here would be, you know, if you wanted to extrapolate from it, that, that uh, you have a feed-forward volley that's telling you something about the sensory environment, and then you have feedback stuff that's essentially imposing upon that sensory input your template of what the world should look like. Well, that's happening later in these kids on the spectrum, and that would make you more vulnerable to just sensory input, more reactive to sensory input, potentially. That's a thought. Okay, do I have time for one more? I, this is a little la last, last experiment. This experiment was done by Ian Feeblecorn. He's at Princeton, and on the job market, you should consider him here if you think about it. He's a brilliant guy. <laughs> so let me explain this experiment to you really quickly. We call this uh, experiment uh, Cars, Guitars, and Dogs. And this actually, this experiment comes out of a long series of studies that Sophie began as a graduate student just a few years ago. Um, so what happens is we have uh, 10 pictures of guitars, 10 pictures of dogs, here's Fido, here's Rex, and 10 pictures of sports cars. Shows you the kinds of things we think about when we're in our lab. And uh, the task of the kids here is right before a block of uh, trials are, 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 you know, they're gonna see hundreds of these stimuli, they're told, this is your target. Every time you see Rex, this particular dog, he's the target, T. These guys, this is a different class, DC, non-target. Cars are irrelevant to you, in other words. This is also a different class, non-target, -tar right? Because guitars are irrelevant to you. You're only going to care about Rex. Now, but Fido and his buddies, they're different, right? Because they're the same class. They're non-targets. They're irrelevant to the performance of the task. But at the same time, they're dogs. So they're going to get you a little bit confused. You're probably going to be a little bit more likely to be confused by this when you're looking for him than by this, right? Fair? So that's the experiment. It's kind of straightforward. Just the thing. So let me show you what happens <laughs> in neurotypical kids with this. So the black trace here, these are just electrodes over the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. The black trace here is the, are the cases where they're the different class non-targets. That's the cars and the guitars in this case. They're irrelevant. And so you get a nice visually evoked response and some cognitive evoked potentials here. So that's the black trace. 
the blue trace is the same class non-target. That's the other dogs. It's not Fido. It's the other dogs that are irrelevant. And so what you can see here, for example, over the left hemisphere, is a kind of fascinating thing. What the neurotypicals are doing is, OK, I've figured out that it's not a car and a guitar. It's a dog. I still don't know which dog it is. So they figure out the class, and then you get this extra response that says it's Fido. So what they're doing is they're going, it's a dog, not a car and a guitar, neurally, I'm speaking. And then they're saying, and in turn, it's Fido. So they do the class first and the specific exemplar second. Right? That's cool and interesting. And there's, the, there's these nice timings to, to show that to you. Now look what's going on in the kids on the spectrum. So the left hemisphere actually is where all the action is here. We'll come back to this. Black trace, that's the different class non-targets. Look at the same class non-targets, all those other dogs. There's not a whit of difference. They're treating the other dogs like they're cars and guitars. And they're only dissociating Fido. So it's the specific exemplar, just that one dog. Everything else is the same to them. They're not doing the class part. This is what, kind of what it looks like. So let me just walk you through these. So, so you know, this is one of the things when you've got lots of electrodes on, you just kind of show one electrode. So here are the typically developing kids. And these are the category-specific effects. So you see what happens is, first of all, they emerge much earlier. I sort of didn't bother telling you about that. See how this stuff is emerging much earlier than it is here in the kids on the spectrum? So it emerges much earlier, and it's highly bilateralized, whereas it's quite, unilater quite lateralized in the kids on the spectrum. Um, and these are the target-specific effects. So here you see that the, the neurotypical kids are figuring out the difference between uh, the classes much earlier uh, and much more bilaterally than the kids on the spectrum. So that's, maybe that's not so important. So, just to wrap up, conclusions and mostly speculations, frankly. Um, imprecise eye movements and reduced saccadic error correction during infancy and autism may lead to a fundamentally differing, different mapping of the visual environment at the level of early retinotopic visual cortices. And I'd add to that then, that if these kinds of very basic sensory motor integration deficits are explanations for these eye movements, that we might want to reconsider then which, you know, sort of the chicken and egg business. Are the social deficits uh, sequelae of these much more fundamental sensory motor integration deficits rather than the other way around, that you've got a social deficit that causes you not to develop uh, high fidelity eye, eye movements, for example? It's just a question. Um, delayed cortical feedback me mechanisms may lead to over-reliance on feed-forward sensory inputs during early visual perceptual processing. An object category representation of the visual system appears to be weakened in, in autism. So there's ample reason, I think, to believe that basic visual perceptual processing is highly atypical in high-functioning children on the autism spectrum. Thanks very much. So we do have some time for some questions. John, maybe I'll ask the first one if I could. Um, so can you say a little bit more about the ASD individuals that were in these studies? <clears throat> Absolutely. So, so yeah, so, so one of the Achilles heels of the work that we've been doing and that really the vast majority of the people in the field are doing, and with the notable exception of Helen, um, is, uh, is that we, you know, we spend a lot of time testing kids who aren't very unwell. They're high-functioning kids. So all of these kids, uh, Sophie will correct me if I'm wrong, would have a performance IQ above 75 or 80, typically. Uh, they're all verbal. They're all walking around. They, but but they're, they're certainly on the autism spectrum. Yeah. Hi, John. Hi, I want to ask you, um, with the eye movements, is there any paradigms to study to look at also the vestibular system's integration for the eye movements? Because I think that's what we see a lot of times clinically. If there's issues that the person can't hold themselves up and stabilize their 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 head and their body mm -hmm. and isolate motion, so yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, th I think that's a fantastic question. I don't know if Philip is still in the room. One of the things that we've been doing, and quite a number of labs around the world now have been doing, so so these kinds of EEG measures were very typically done in an electrically shielded booth because of the way you had to sort of worry about uh, signal to noise and noise ratios and that. The technologies now are incredibly light, incredibly mobile. You've, I'm sure you've seen this. So we can actually get people up and walking around and doing that. So, so in our Mobi device, mobile brain body imaging device, now we do high density 
electrophysiology in these kids as they're moving. But it's a big challenge to integrate eye movements, eye movement uh, research at that point, because again, in the same way, uh, eye movements are typically recorded from people who are in a chin rest in a very stable environment. So the only way to do accurate eye movements then is to get something that's wearable on the head, and that's hard to do with EEG because then that gets in the way of everything. That's, so, but that's that's we're actually right in the middle of trying to solve precisely that problem. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk about it sometime in the next year. Do you know that one of her last paper was on blindness in autism? And she really spent a lot of her work actually trying to figure out the interaction between not being able to see and being on the spectrum. So I thought oh, really, I recommend to read that paper. Thanks, Sophie. Thanks, Sophie. Very good point. Thank you, sir.